Okay, so I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to um, to to be um, with this panel of uh, of writers that I really respect and that I um, I've grown to just you know I love their work and the things be just not just the the actual written work that they do but the way that they are out there doing the work for the culture and um, sort of like uh, capturing, like taking us in, right? Cause I'm, I, I was born and raised here in New York city. So, um, but my roots are Dominican, right? Like we have these strong ties. So it's, um, it's important for us to be a part of like a community that, that embraces us and that where we can flourish. And um, that's why I'm, I'm very grateful to um, Angela Abreu from the Dominican writers for really um, being there and like connecting, like she just connects, she's able to connect everybody and um, sort of like be there at the at the forefront for um, for ways to um, elevate and provide the different platforms for Dominican writers. Um, I was I was lucky enough to to go to her uh, to the Dominican writers conference last year. And it, and it felt, I would say it felt like being at a party, right? Like just seeing people that I've, that I've known and that I've seen in a long time and, and just listening to so many different artists. And when I saw Josefina Baez's name on, um, as the keynote speaker, I was like, oh my goodness, Josefina is like, she's been somebody that I've always been inspired by. I met Josefina when I was at Fordham University like eons ago. And I was like, Diandre, y quien es esta, esta, esta tigre aquí, que tal? She's like breaking all these rules, you know? And like, just like the way that she plays around with words and like um, just having fun. And it's sort of like validated um, what I've always thought ever since I was a little girl because uh, Spanish is my first language. Porque los papá mío vienen, vinieron de un campo. I didn't uh, know how to speak English when I was little, but then the influence of going to school. So um, I come from that generation that we really move within both languages. And um, my background then as a bilingual special education teacher, I study linguistics and a lot of this code switching and when people code switch. And um, really, you know, it's when um, you, you have to have a command of both languages because you're not gonna, tú no vas a tirar de que palabra ahí porque por tirarla, de que, oh, déjame tirar una palabrita en inglés o en español. You know, like you have to have some type of connection and a cultural connection too, right? And I hear a lot of my students and the way that they're, because um, I feel like, but with the movement of people, right, going back and forth, se lleva el idioma, ¿verdad? El idioma, lo, la, los dichos que se dicen en el Alto Manhattan, se, se llevan para Santo Domingo, you know, and it's like that back and forth. So um, that's one of the things that, that we're going to be exploring, but um, that's uh, pretty much, you know, our interest and we, um, I'm gonna just leave it there. I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce all the panelists because we're really in great company. Um, I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order, and um, so everybody's gonna read something that they that they brought. They're gonna then we're just gonna talk about you know we're gonna talk a little bit and just you know see where the conversation takes us. Okay, so um, the first person I am going to introduce is Amanda Alcantara. Amanda is a writer and journalist. She is the author of Chula 2019. Her work has been featured on the anthology Latinas Struggle and Protest in 21st Century USA. The poetry anthology Latinx and several media publications like NPR's Latino USA, Remezcla, the San Francisco Chronicles and others. Amanda has a bachelor's from Rutgers University and a master's from NYU. A map of the world turned upside down hangs on her wall. So I actually have that um, anthology right here. So a big shout out. There's like, you know, 
uh, this is like, you know, this is like going to a party too. Cause when I opened it up, I was like, oh my goodness, I know like so many, so many people in here. So it's, it's um, amazing. Okay, so. Hi Marilyn, thank you. I just wanted to say hi quickly <laughs> before you continue the introductions. I'm okay. so happy to be here. Hello everyone. Okay, Rosanna Calderon is a writer and editor born in Brooklyn, New York and raised in the Dominican Republic. She emerges from a new generation of young Latin writers in the United States. After more than 10 years of providing support to students in underserved areas of New York, Calderon opted to dive into unknown waters and wrote her first book, La Casa de las Maletas. 2019, New York City. With an intrinsic, intrinsic ability to describe through her writing what often seems irrational to the brain and emotional to the heart. In her book, Roxana uses her original voice to speak about those things nobody dares to. Calderon has been featured in lagaleria.com, Un Verano en Nueva York, 2019, Dominican Writers, Las Hijas de Machepa, 2019, Spanglishvoices.com, El Componente en Confesión a un Desconocido, 2020. She has also participated in the anthologies from the America's Poetry Festival of New York, Multilingual Anthology, Just Listen, Solo Escucha, 2019, and in the Latin American Anthology, El Vuelo Más Largo, published by Ángeles del Papel Editores in Peru. Roxana is part of the editorial team of the literary digital magazine, Spanglish Voices, and is a collaborator at the Dominican Writers Organization. Her work was recently highlighted in two of the most important newspapers in the Dominican Republic, Diario Libre and Listín Diario. Roxana Calderón lives in New York and works as a senior program director in Washington Heights, overseeing various educational programs at a local non-for-profit organization. Hello, Roxana. Hola, hola. Buenas noches a todos y un, un placer. Gracias por tenerme aquí. Okay, Fior E. Plasencia, Mujer con Voz, a lover of merengue and guava mermelade, was born in Jarabacoa, Dominican Republic. An artist and poet who studied history and education at the City University of New York, Brooklyn College. Her work has appeared in the Acentos Review, La Galeria Magazine, and Sands Canyon Review. She has also been featured in different anthologies, Voces del Café, 2018, Somos el Grito, Antología Internacional de Voces Femeninas, 2020, and others. Placencia is also the author of the poetry book, Para Cenar Habrá Nostalgia, DWA Press. You can find her work at mujerconvoz.com. Hi, Fior. Buenas noches a todos. Hola, Marilyn. Gracias por la oportunidad. Welcome. Okay. Eh, Edwin Rosario Mazara. I don't know. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. Sabe, aquí tirando de que un chin de. Edwin, or as his close friends call him, Mazara, is the founder of the literary magazine. Spanglish Voices, as well as the founder and producer of the YouTube talk show, La Sala Talks. Hace un tiempo, no muy lejano, se enfoque, se, se enfoque a, a has been invested on three central areas, social thinking, social influence, and social behavior in humans. Esto intereses lo llevaron a incursionar en la rama de social psychology y convertirse en un hater of psychoanalysis. Sorry, Freud, and thank you, from. 
Masara es un humanista y activista comunitario que ama las miles de historia de los desconocidos y esas verdades que visibilizan a los de abajo en esta tierra. He loves reading, la música, nature y un buen trago, sin importar el label. Hello. Oh, hello, hello, buenas noches. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Y a todos que están por ahí, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, so we don't have to start in, in, in alphabetical order. Anybody want to start um, start us off is fine. So whoever, like if somebody just wants to volunteer, you want to just um, start reading your piece and talking a little bit about your work. No se peleen, señores, por, por ser lo primero. I can go first. Yo, yo me preparé mentalmente para ir primero porque pensé que iba a ser por orden alfabético. So, <laughs> so I can go first. Um, that. That's okay. That's cool. So hi, everyone, again. Eh, yo soy Amanda Alcántara. Now I don't even know what language to talk. I'm like... <laughs> Because everybody was like, Buenas noches, gracias por invitarme. And I'm like, oh, wait, hold up. This is in both languages. Um, so yeah, like Marilyn said, thank you so much for, for inviting me. I'm the author of Chula. Um, tonight, I wanted to read a couple of pieces from there. And yeah, and basically just like answer some questions and be in conversation with everyone else on this panel who I know, who I appreciate, who, tú sabes, Hey, Kang, mira, un corito sano, yo lo quiero mucho a ustedes, so I'm very grateful. When I saw the other panelists, I was like, oh, snap. Estamos en familia. All right, so I'm going to start with this piece <clears throat> that is mostly in Spanish, actually. And yeah. So it goes, call me Matitina. Escandalosa desde niña. La más chula y la más linda. De adulta, una conscious gentle diva. Tú te creerás Dios, pero yo por hombre no me pongo de rodilla. Si la más puta, soy la más fina. Travel the world with red lipstick, international caperucita. Que bellos mis ojos y grande mi sonrisa. Speak in three tongues, parcel mouth, boquita. Si te pica, es mi mariquita. A, 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 E, 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 esta es mi dicha. Bebiendo con triclú y ganando la partida. Santiago means the world and mis pupilas. I'm a pupil, maestra, y la enseñanza misma. Escribiendo desde chiquita, I might have to put this on genius porque está caliente la tinta. Dirán que soy privona, pero esta es mi vida y la vivo como una tigra. Y este cuerpo es mi casa. Y aquí Amanda es la que manda. Y esta es mi real patria. A ella le canto himnos. Mi bandera, mi cara, mi nutrición, la lavanda. Riqueza por dentro, ellos quieren robarla. Mis ancestros me aguardan. Y no me digas mamacita hasta que sea madrecita. Soy bonita y te gano en Jeopardy porque soy lista. Radio Bemba de noticia, escuchando música y de cuentista. Antillana y caribeñista, vendiendo empanadas dita, autonomía bendita. Con mis hermanas estoy activa y para lo que venga, guía siempre, lista. All right. I'm only reading two, so I'm going to read one more and then, you know, we can continue talking. This one is called My Last Heartbreak. Also, I have allergies, so I apologize if I have to be all sneezy. All right. My Last Heartbreak. Heartbreak feels like joie de vivre. La misma capacidad de ser feliz es la misma de ser triste. Así es el balance. When my heart aches, nectar comes from my eyes. I have to learn to weave my heart together. This time, though, it feels different, like this pain is connecting me to something greater. If I can feel so much pain, so alive, so tender, then God must be real. She is here. This pain, this ability to feel pain, this self-awareness is our curse, but also what makes us feel like we're little gods chilling. El dolor es la enfermedad, Y también la cura. Thank you.
yo puedo continuar si quieren. Thank you, Amanda. I just, I just want to uh, say one thing, like, um, you just made me think about, like, como lo dicho también, you know, like that, that we, that we uh, sort of like inherit. So, okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Rosana. Thank you. Wanna, you you want to continue, Rosana? Sure. Yo tengo un poema en Spanglish, un solo poema, es un poquito larguito, entonces creo que eh, va a ser suficiente. Se llama Margen. Déjenme un segundo, por favor. Ok. They say, they say I have an accent. Sacan conjeturas acerca de la modulación de mi pronunciación. Like I don't know how to articulate and put phrases together para que suenen correctamente. Dicen de mí lo que yo no digo de ellos. They point fingers at me and secretly laugh because their native tongue no es mi lenguaje. No me ven. Se rehusan a explorar la profundidad de mi ser y solo escuchan el ruido extraño que producen mis palabras as I spit them dancing Caribbean tones out of my mouth. They are unable to recognize the warrior in me. They can see the efforts of my soul as my brain tries to translate word by word, mientras me acostumbra a otra cultura, a otras prácticas, a otros hábitos. They think my method of human communication is broken. Fruncen el seño para dejarme saber que no entienden lo que digo. They do to me what I don't do to them. They ignore that my mother's tongue is foreign, exotic. No respetan los verbos que conjugo al hablar. But when they try to speak in my first tongue, I don't judge them for killing the adverbs and the proverbs of my ancestors' vocabulary. Yo no hago gestos extraños con la, flint, con la frente. Yo los aplaudo por, por hacer un esfuerzo, for grasping something that is not theirs and embracing it like they gave birth to it. No les pregunto de dónde vienen cuando los escucho hablar. Yo los celebro. No les hago lo que me hacen a mí. I don't tell them their accent is heavy as if they were lifting bricks cada vez que dicen algo. Me hacen sentir como si debiera ocultar mi habilidad de expresarme y ahogarme with all the sentences I cannot properly put together. Según ellos, tengo la boca llena de errores. They are unaware of all the opportunities I've lost because I was ashamed de la influencia del dialecto de mi abuelo en mi manera de hablar. I wanted to belong. I wanted to speak like them, but I couldn't because I am me. Analizando, me he dado cuenta de que mi acento sí es pesado because it is full of strength, carrying stories full of tropical air and all the words I kept to myself because I was afraid to talk. Ya no soy esclava de mis pensamientos. I have decided to set my words free. Gracias. Thank you. Um, Maria, uh, uh, Maria, I can go next if you want. <laughs> the chat is blowing up. I love it. All right. Okay, Fiore. Hey. Antes que nada, le quiero dar un abrazo a todos, a las, a todas las personas que no estoy viendo en la cámara, pero sé que están ahí oyendo. Amanda, un abrazo, te extraño aquí en este lado. <risa> eh, es un placer y un honor estar al lado de estas personas que tanto admiro. Ellos saben quién son. Pero uh, siguiendo con el tema de, de no identificarse con un lenguaje, because you are in a different country and you're trying to blend in, uh, my book talks really a lot about that. I'm going to be reading the poem Dilemma Mío. Si miro para abajo, que estoy leyendo, gente. <laughs> Dilemma Mío. Intuition, savage, morir, soñando, run through my rizos. Test scores, jumping back and forward in la postentro, breaking the calmness one by one. Te quiero tibia, sublime y anacaona. Has me your king of Lembur Arepa. How you don't comprehend? Juan Pablo Duarte can just get away from the historical concept. Oh my, Coco, I don't care si ahora tendré que memorize 
oh, the Native American chief, la hipocresía de la Gran Depresión, NASA, the terms of the president, la Constitución, sus víctimas y sus osorras. Yes, yes, yo sigo las dos. ¿Cuál es la vaina? You can call me a marciano when you, tú, sí, tú, sir, you are a product of the puritanos. So dejemos la indifference and like you are cautious to say, do not take it personally. You are a plátano que no termina de desarrollar. Stop my passport, si va años with superstitions. Una sonrisa plástica en dance and dreams en cumplidos. I will have to blend bachata con yo, Major. Recuerdos con el Empire State Building. Make me wake up early en la mañanita, fumado, lo cold, cold weather. Make me piel canela, pero por no, concho. I refuse to be la copia de tu zafacón. Soy mi propio laboratorio. Soy una sola. Yo, Caribe, y todas las cosas. <ríe> Mari, uh, Marilyn, me deja saber si puedo leer otro. O hasta ahí, hasta ahí llegamos. <ríe> um, Tú puedes leer el otro. Thank you. Tato, tato. O sea, estoy en vivo, déjenme buscar el poema. Gracias, Anabel. Siempre en vivo y, y ayudando a los otros. En lo que tú el lo próximo buscas, que voy a... Sí. En lo que tú lo buscas, voy a leer algunos de, lo, de los comentarios. Um, si, eh, sigamos celebrando nuestro maravilloso y rico acento, Rosana, con orgullo y sin vergüenza. Gracias, hermoso, beautiful. Thank you, Rosana. Eh, thank you, abrazos. Gracias, gracias, Fior, por ese fuego. Tú sabes, Caribe, <laughs> todas nuestras cosas. Gracias, for Fior. And um, also for Amanda. Amanda got some love too. Thank you. And, and um, wishing her well. Y, okay, we that, you know, this is the, the commitment, the passion, you know, like she's. She's maybe not feeling, uh, you know, 100%, but that's aquí. Eh, brava, Amanda. Okay, so thank you. Gracias. Feel better, somebody said. Lizette. Okay, thank you. Okay, Phil, go ahead. No le voy a quitar mucho tiempo a Edwin, porque quiero oír lo que va a decir. <laughs> este poema se llama De línea del hambre y del espera, y se lo escribí a mi mamá. Está en Spanish también. Más inglés que en español. Long lineas de anxiety are following me. I woke up early than usual. 3 a.m. is my ordinary time to stumble out of bed while my E has to snore in Spanish. I thought I'd made the right choice of crossing the Atlantis in chancletas. Look at me begging for food with back in my patio's aguacates grew. I don't think this is enough. Look at me begging for food. I have all the papers necessary to prove my starvation, my broken English, my piece of soul, my unemployment, my fire hard working ass and my insecurities. I'm roughly naked with full shelters of prayers. Las palabras are not sufficient to outline the struggle or being in a place that talks back to you with attitude, indifference, arrogancia. I came here first to this place, to this building, that smells like a place that says no, says no all the time to my needs, says no all the time to my suffering, says no all the time to my sleep, says no all the time to my life. I'm still in this tender line with others that have eyes bleeding for some humanidad. I don't know which one of us is starving more. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Fiore. Okay, so um, Edwin Rosario Masara. Am I saying your last name correctly? Sí, sí. And, and if it's not, and if not, it doesn't matter. It's Spanish. We podemos hablar con la que olvidate de esto. Fiol, that was beautiful. Amanda, Roxana. Yo no sé si es necesario que yo lea porque esas tres matatanas hicieron su labor ahora mismo. El mío un poquito largo. And it's something that I wrote many years ago when I shared it on the, on the platform that we have. It starts mainly in English, but then it starts to sprinkle the Spanglish all over, okay? So I'm not a reader, so don't criticize me, but I will read it out loud. History teaches us that the mar marginalized always use art as a means of speaking about their pain and sorrows. Art 
whether it's music or poetry, was also used as coded language that motivated those who suffered to rise and fight. It was a means of communicating the next battleground strategy for their freedom. And it was, and still is, the sole means of preserving, establishing, or establishing an identity. It, allow, it allows those who are the afflicted to deconstruct the false narratives opposed by those colonizers who try to erase their existence and who they will become. The oprimidos will speak their language as they wish through their art. With it, they will challenge those who demanded them to shed their cultural skins so they could become a cultural crossbreed by demand rather than by osmosis. Latinos, bueno, para ser más sincero, Boricuas in the 70s, es decir, a few Puerto Rican poets did this boldly via the art form called the spoken word in esa época. This is when poetry meets the revolution and becomes a mouthpiece of those in the barrios, spitting fuego, la verdad, la pura. Now this is poetry. Now this poetry was not the roses are red and violets are blue nonsense, no, claro que no. It was their community's ID card and, and rhymes, poetry that showed the world, especialmente the Anglos, the identity of the New Yorkers, papa. It was the art their identity, their language. No one boxed these Boricuas in a subgroup for census purposes. No way, Jose. They were both Puerto Rican and New Yorkers and spoke Spanish, both Spanish and English together. Así, como un arroz con pollo. And they were great at this. To experience it all, one had to do was go, all one had to do was go to the Puerto Rican obituary and listen to Pedro Pietri speak the truth, hermano. After all, the dominant themes in his poem were about racial injustice, labor, and death. The pain he felt to see his Puerto Rican brothers and sisters as they work, they work, and they work, under so much injustice was evident in his work. El dolor to see them all die yesterday, today, and will die again tomorrow, passing their bill collectors on the next of kin. All die waiting for the Garden of Eden to open up again. All die. Era su gran dolor. Powerful, hermano this up in solidarity. One hears the message and understands clearly that many have died chasing a utopian dream, the American dream in a dystopian society. Now on paper, these poems were also jewels, muy buenos. They were laser and were sliced through metal. Those written poems were sliced through all the hay. Willy Perdomo did just that con sus poemas. He advised future writers that the best way to accomplish this was writing about what you know. Perdomo explained that with the following words. I will stop feeding the wind that takes all the lights from the urban studies. And from now on, I will use the true colors to write about what I know. True colors, oye, los colores verdaderos. A remarkably interesting point. Después de todo, our beautiful people son todos people of color. Extremely powerful for Perdomo con ese pensamiento. To live via the words of these talented artists, to really embrace them, era un ecstasy. Oh, yeah, man. to understand meant you were, you were welcome to the revolution. For example, when the Grand Street teacher from Manhattan's Lower East Side, Miguel Piñero, once spoke about seeking the cause, he wanted all to comprend that he meant staying woke and not chasing the American dream, which was problematic because for many, chasing the dream only meant gaining many material things. Pero Piñero sabía that it came with a steep price, your soul, tu alma bacano. Miguel's voice still echoes through time. You can hear him. Oye, listen closely as, he's, as he recites his poem. Downtown, uptown, midtown, crosstown. This need to be a part, this need to, to be part of the push for change. Si, sí, la revolucion. Let Piñero and others to create a home for this art form. La Casa of the Spoken Word, the New Yorkers Poets Cafe. Where art became the revolution and gave all a sense of one's real identity, shredding away the colonial tag where one could speak Spanglish sin que nadie les diga nada, where any Latino would walk in feeling helplessness and would walk out as, a, as powerful as ever. Yo comprendo what it means to live under the duality of two cultures as those New Yorkans who created that safe haven and LES did. Es que yo soy dominicano americano, yo soy dominican york, who speaks English, speaks Spanish, and guess what? Cuando me da la gana, I speak Spanglish. And this is why I understand how important it was for all those extraordinary artists to lend their talents to the deconstruction of the false narratives. Those imposed by those colonizers who tried to erase who they were, 
who we are and who we have become. After all, como dijo Piñero, the cause we are seeking, that cause we have always desired is downtown, uptown, midtown, crosstown. La pura verdad es que el arte también es nuestra revolución. Y hasta ahí llegó. Wow, thank you so much. You really, um, you were dropping some names there and I'm thinking like you took me way back like to um, Pedro Pietri and with his Puerto Rican obituary. And I'm like thinking, you know, like people that have paved the way too, right? Like that, um, like I, I really felt like you were paying homage to um, to some of these people and, and you take us right into um, like the first question here and, um, why do you use Spanglish, right? Like why, like, how do you, how does that uh, move your story and where, like what places uh, does it come from? Um, and I think Edwin, you really like touched a lot. It was almost like, I felt like this was like, a, you know, like, it was like the sociology of the self, you know, like you went through this whole, uh, thing and like a history of New York too. So um, thank you for that. But uh, can, oh yes, I would definitely like to read that too. So we're gonna start. I'm gonna like switch it up a little bit right now. So I'm gonna start with Fjord. Um, so um, please Fjord, uh, just take that wherever you want to take it. Like you know, like what is Spanglish to you, and why do you use it, and you know, like how does that like move your story along? Marilyn, I can spend the whole night talking about Spanglish stuff because that's all I write about. <laughs> but I am not going to do that because we have places to be, things to do. Uh, I wrote a list of things that remind me of, like, why is it the main reason why, like, I touch so much in Spanish? And I'm thinking that uh, I'm trying to not only connect with my culture in the Dominican Republic, but I'm also trying to adapt to this new society that I'm in. Uh, but I also, also being part of the diaspora is challenging. And I remember being, uh, being in, um, in my bilingual class when I was 12 years old and trying to learn a, a new language. It was extremely difficult for me to like learn one of them completely uh, like well. So what I did instead of learning one fully, I tried I, just to bridge them together and, be, and they become one. Se hicieron parte de lo que yo soy, lo que yo vivo, mi influencia día a día. Pero también creo que mi, mi español también es una manera de, de no dejar mi, isla, mi pedazo de tierra, como le digo yo. Y, y como dice él, también es una forma de, de, de enfrentarse al establecimiento contra lo, lo establecido. A mí me critican mucho porque yo uso el, el, el Spanglish, pero no el Spanglish perfecto, que digamos, eh, yo también lo mezclo con el Dominicano, ¿verdad? Que sí, con lo, lo que hablamos cualquier día y no necesariamente está bien de acuerdo con las personas de la alta sociedad y eso les choca a la gente, pero para mí es una manera de, de encontrar eh, la persona que soy, de no abandonar mis raíces, pero también de encontrar mi identidad y, y por eso escribo en español me siento cómoda escribiendo así y te digo que hay, hay muchos de los poemas que escribo también a veces son en español nada más porque también ahí me siento cómoda, me siento en casa, no sé si los demás se, se conectan. Pero, again, es una manera de, de enfrentarme con lo, lo establecido. Y yo sigo a Josefina Valle, yo soy una seguidora de ella. Si yo sé que Josefina me dice, Fior, escribe como tú sabes. Y si yo escribo en español, así voy a escribir. No, no me importa qué piensa el demás, porque yo primero escribo para mí. Y, si, y el propósito es para yo de encontrarme. Y si hay personas que se encuentran con mi escrito, Mejor todavía, ¿no? Uf, I love that. You took me back with that. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really like your identity, right? Like, that's what you're saying. Um, let's go with Amanda. You want to talk a little bit on that? Yeah, I feel like I'm having a bit of an identity crisis. Um, porque yo estoy ahora en, en República Dominicana. Eh, me voy a quedar aquí por unos meses, quizá más, vamos a ver. Y, o sea, 
me gustó mucho eh, escuchar el texto de todos, me gustó mucho lo de Roxana, lo que decía, o sea, el mensaje del texto tuyo sobre tener acento de aquí, viviendo allá, y Edwin, me gustó mucho que mencionaste lo de New York Weekend, por lo que pasó esta semana, ¿verdad? Que, que Miguel Agarín passed away. Um, yeah, and to me, I feel like, because I'm here, trying to write in, in English and Spanglish, and it's like my brain is like scrambled, you know, because I'm speaking Spanish now most of the day. Whereas in the US, I was speaking Spanglish actually most of the day. And um, I participated in a, a poetry competition here, a poetry slam called Boxeo. Y I got third place, so I'm very proud of myself. But I also noticed I was very afraid of using English. I was very afraid of using English. I feel like, I feel like it's a little stigmatized here. Um, y, y siento a veces que incluso el uso, <coughs> Que el uso del Spanglish, I feel like it's stigmatized within the old school, like Dominican literary world, um, like Spanish speaking literary world. And it's, it's, it's very interesting to me because I felt, I don't know, I, whenever I use Spanglish, I always felt like it was a celebration, you know? And, and this week I've been thinking about it. And I'm like, I think it's, it felt like a celebration because of the work that, of the New Yorkian because of what it means to be a diaspora, because there, I feel like there's like a, a connection where it's like, we know, we understand this. But being here, I'm a little scared. I'm not gonna lie. I'm a little scared of using Spanglish. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I kind of have to push through that, right? And just write how I write, um, like Fior said. Um, yeah, but, you know, to me, it's really, it's about writing in a way that feels like home. And for a lot of us, Spanglish is home, you know? Thank you, Amanda. Wow, you're really giving us uh, that different perspective. Because yes, you you just, te mudaste para Santo Domingo. So, ahora como tú, ¿verdad? Aquí, like you said, it's like, it's, it's who you are, it's home. So, now it's like you're trying to find that new home over there, right? Like, como, and and maybe and you made me think of like uh the research that was done and like the dominican the so-called dominican york right and like how like que tú no sabes hablar bien que eh, hablando tanto inglés like you know like but no yeah yeah and yeah and i mean not not to no para interrumpirte but i also feel like it's it is also because english has a different function here where it's more like imperialist it's more like you're imposing another language on people you know so um, to me, like when I'm in La Calle, I don't, I don't, I speak Spanish, but I'm saying in my writing specifically and within like that competition specifically, there was a lot of improvisation and I got stuck so much because my brain just was not finding the words. Um, and it made me think like, okay, I, I think there's a little bit of both. I think there is a little bit of like being conscious of what it means to speak English in the Dominican Republic and that being, you know, something that you like a sense of entitlement, like you're not, you, you don't impose that on people. But I also think that there is a stigma with like Dominican Yorks and, and writing in Spanglish, even if we're just talking from like a literary world sense and not from like an imposing sense. I'm curious if the other writers feel that way a little bit. Damn, that'd be mad layers up in there. Okay, let's go. Uh, okay, Edwin, you wanna talk a little bit about that? So um, your question was, what, why do I use Spanglish in, in my work? Yes, and you could talk a little bit or you can add to the conversation too, anything that anybody else has said, if you wanna. Um, oh, cool, cool. I mean, it, it's, it's definitely something that's natural for me. Um, born and raised in, you know, in New York, and it's funny because the first introduction that I had to Spanglish was literally through my older, you know, older folks, my parents, my grandparents, not because they were doing it uh, purpose, you know, as a, as a mode of identity that, that they chose, but rather because it was a mechanism of them of defense during a moment when they couldn't really communicate well because of the, because they didn't 
have that stronghold of the English language yet. So they will start, you know, out in the street, they will run up to someone who doesn't speak a lick of Spanish and they will talk to them in English, you know, say a few words. Uh, Listen, can you tell me, donde que queda esto? And then all of a sudden, como decía, como dice un buen dominicano, se le acababa la tarjeta de inglés. And then they would switch all the way back into Spanish. So that was like formally the first introduction to me as a child of, of two worlds, of two languages, um, being used as a means of communicating in dialogue. And, and, you know, and it does challenge a lot. It is challenging when you have all these purists who try to to tell you that it was a mutilation of both, you know, either Spanish specifically, you know, Dominican parents that, and family that we had, but it was also challenging when you spoke it in front of someone who only spoke English as well. And they thought that you were trying to not assimilate and impose yourself, which that's what we were doing, you know, because the whole thing with Spanglish is that we don't assimilate. It's a matter of not being a traditionalist or wanting to assimilate either. You know, we're, we're forging our own, we're, we forge our own identity and it's still evolving because it's a living language. You know, it, it's not, it's not, it's not something that's going to finish taking form. Um, so that's why it translates into, into anything that I could write as well. And, and you know, and it, we could dispel the myth because everyone who's here speaks perfectly well both languages. You know, it's not that we're, that we're looking into one or the other at the same time because we're lacking that 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 whole of that grabs of the language rather than because that it is an identity that's who we are and that's the most important thing of it, it when we speak spanglish we're truly being free i love that piece when we speak spanglish we're, we're being free um yeah and i just thought about you know my first introduction with spanglish and i guess it was like a lot of the words that didn't exist in Spanish, right? Como el co, el etín. So, um, you know, because there are different different reasons why I think that people um, use Spanglish. Could just be like an emphasis, como cosa del amor, suena más bonita en español, ¿verdad? So I think that when we, do, uh, cuando dominamos los dos idiomas, and like, bueno, you know, it's different than like saying like, oh, you look good, you know, it's like more emphasis in Spanish, in Spanish, so you can throw some of those words like that, but you do need to have commands, and it's true, like everybody that's here, like everybody, you know, you're moving between both languages with such ease, we, we all are, right, and it is part of ident our identity, and it's, and it's part of like, I guess, being in the diaspora, and just being um, people that you know, like we're making our own way, our own path, our own like um, cultural identities that we're not like just giving into anything, right? Especially if like we've, uh, you know, si no no dejamos back in the in the seventies, como eh, we weren't stripped of our identity. We're not gonna. It's not gonna happen now. <laughs> um. So who? Okay, Roxana. So why do you use why do you use Spanglish um, and you know the meaning uh, of it in your in your work? Oh, eh, bueno, yo voy a hablar más en español que en inglés. Voy a hacer una, una mezcla pequeña ahí. Eh, mi idioma principal es el español. Ese fue con el idioma que yo crecí y el primer idioma que aprendí a hablar. Um, yo aprendí a hablar el, el inglés ya porque me tocó cuando me mudé aquí a los Estados Unidos para sobrevivir. Eh, el Spanglish después del inglés, que era como en ese momento mi idioma de, de, ok, si tú no aprendes, no te vas a poder hablar de la escuela, no vas a poder entrar a la universidad, no vas a poder conseguir trabajo. Entonces me tocó. Pero entre el español y el, y el me tocó del inglés apareció el Spanglish, que se convirtió realmente en mi idioma de supervivencia, en lo que yo podía asimilar y, y entender, eh, poder articular y poner oraciones juntas. Eh, el Spanglish salía ahí como que déjame ayudarte en lo que te vas desarrollando. Y, y me sacó de muchas. Eh, la mayor cantidad de mi escritura es en español. Eh, si va como así, como, como decía Marilyn, con una línea romántica, es como que se escucha más bonito. Y, y al ser mi, mi idioma natal, es como que los pensamientos me vienen más fáciles en español. 
eh, yo escribo en inglés, pero siempre eh, el, el inglés viene automáticamente cuando estoy escribiendo, cuando me siento enojada y comienzo a escribir, llega, así llega, es como que se transforma el cerebro y se vuelve gringo y, y el enojo lo saca totalmente en, en inglés. Y cuando escribo en Spanglish, uf, eso es como que <ríe> un, una explosión ahí eh, radical que, que sucede entre la suavidad del español, la agresividad que siento cuando escribo en inglés y, y tengo que decir esto para sobrevivir porque no, no lo puedo ni decir ni en español ni lo puedo decir en inglés, entonces tengo que decirlo en Spanglish porque es demasiado fuerte. Entonces ahí llega el Spanglish en, en, mí, en, en mi escritura. Wow, thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'm having like a little problem with my camera right now. Um, but let's just move into what type of criticisms have you faced when using Spanglish? Uh, Fiona, do you want to start us off? Of course. Tanto que me tiran tu tono comentario. There's a lot of like, I don't know, stigma about using Spanish, especially if people are reading you from the island. Because sometimes they feel like you are denying like the culture. I don't know exactly what it, what exactly you're denying if you use um, only English or whatever Spanish. But that's like a stigma like that you are denying your identity, I think, in ways, which I don't think so. But yeah, that's one thing. Um, but uh, I hear a lot of people complaining and like, I'm messing up the language in ways, or I'm taking away the uh, el valor de la lengua. Le, le, le estoy poniendo como, como, como la, estoy, la estoy usando como si fuera de un barrio. La estoy poniendo de baja clase. Muchas veces la gente me dice, ¿por qué, por qué tú no la, la escribes como los demás escritores? Y, y para ellos es como quitar el valor a la palabra si es en Spanglish. Yo no sé, Amanda, si tú tienes ese problema ya, por aquí me tira mucho diciéndome, tú deberías nada más escribir, si vas a escribir español, escribe en español, pero no, no lo, lo comienzas a mezclar porque tú estás dañando el lenguaje. Esa es una de las cosas que me pasan a mí. Yes, that's true. It's a colonizing language too, but in a way, yo pienso, yo aprendí a hablar el español primero que el inglés. So, yo pienso dos lenguas de colonizadores, pero para empezado el español se siente como más en casa porque es la que aprendí cuando era niña, ¿verdad que sí? Si hubiera sido al revés, hubiera sentido que es el inglés, ¿verdad? Pero en, en maneras, la gente piensa que uno está quitando la esencia de la dominicanidad. No sé, ¿qué piensan ustedes? Yo quiero... Eh, decir algo que tiene que ver mucho con lo que tú acabas de mencionar eh, yo no he experimentado en lo personal eso de que o habla inglés o habla español porque está dañando eh, el lenguaje tampoco he experimentado ningún tipo de, de crítica ni, ni escribiéndolo ni hablándolo yo sí he sido crítica de, del uso del Spanglish en algunas ocasiones para serte sincera porque y, y es algo que también podemos debatir aquí. Eh, obviamente cada quien va a escribir como le salga. Nadie te tiene que dictar a ti cómo tú tienes que escribir ni en qué lenguaje te tienes que manejar. Pero en una manera ya eh, visual y del de punto de vista del lector, a veces yo como, como, como persona que lee, eh, me encuentro con algunos textos que si digo eh, hay un abuso de... De, del Spanglish porque eh, tú te das cuenta que no, cuando lo lees que no es de manera natural sino como que hay un force lo quieren forzar, quieren hacer el Spanglish forzado, entonces yo creo que eso es lo que hace también que le traiga como que un público negativo a, a, al idioma, porque hay también hay más sobre más personas como yo eh, no son lo más seguro de con la mente tan abierta y de una vez técnicamente lo, cata eh, lo catalogan como que no, está mal hecho. Pero es porque, o sea, como que siempre como una manzana buena daña todas la, eh, las que están ahí en el canasto. Eh, sí he visto mucho eso. 
eh, hay personas que les sale bastante natural que lo escriben y, y es como, como, como ir limpiándote cuando tú vas escribiendo, o sea, tú, tú no lo forzas, pero sí veo muchos textos que es como que me voy a sentar y voy a escribir esto en Spanglish eh, de manera forzada, porque tiene que ser así en Spanglish y porque yo lo quiero en Spanglish y cuando tú lo lees como lector, no funciona. Entonces eso le trae mala fama a las personas como Fior, eh, a las Amanda, eh, a, la, a los escritores que sí, que esa es su manera natural de escribir. Eh, yo voy a, a, a continuar también y decir que, Rosana, cuando tú comenzaste, yo estaba como que... <risa> Pero terminé estando de acuerdo contigo porque yo le he visto eso mucho en televisión también, en screenwriting, que tratan como de meter el Spanglish y lo ponen de una manera que no es natural o que quizá no es el Spanglish que usaría la persona latina que están tratando de mostrar en la televisión. O sea, como que, ¿por qué esta persona suena mexicana siendo dominicana? Y así. Eh, sí, en verdad es la manera de eso, para decirte que estoy de acuerdo en eso, de que sí, hay veces que, que sí lo veo un poco así, como esforzado. Eh, y quería decir que para mí personalmente yo no he recibido así críticas muy directas, pero sí como pullita. You know, like there's people that are like, that when they're reading my book, they, they get... They expressed that they, they were uncomfortable because it was in Spanglish and they, they're either monolingual, mostly in English or mostly in Spanish. And to me, I mean, that was a fear when I was writing the book because I was like, I feel like it's for, for a very specific crowd, but I kind of just accepted it for this project. You know, I was like, if, if that's what it's going to be, if it's for a specific crowd, that's okay. The Spanglish crowd is still pretty big and, and needs a home too, you know? Um, but I have gotten people that when they say it, they don't say it from a place of like, but I understand, they say it from a place of they're uncomfortable, that they, that, that, that they can't, that they can't relate. Y Fior, quería decir que está fuerte lo que tú dijiste de dañando el lenguaje. And I have heard that too. Like I haven't heard it about my work specifically, but I have heard people like I have heard that expression. Um, and and yeah, it's super interesting. It's it's interesting, and and I think I mean we're just gonna have to keep doing what we're doing anyways. <laughs> um, so definitely like. Actualmente yo no he recibido ningún tipo de crítica por escribir así. Sí, however, when I was a child, yes. When I was a child in school, I did get a lot of criticism specifically for people who were related to me. Um, and I always thought of it, como dijo Gloria in her book, Borderlands, it was just a matter of them trying to get to tame wild tongues. So yeah, they always wanted to control your tongue, the way you spoke, the way you felt. Um, And that was due to the fact that they just didn't understand que el lenguaje es, era un modo de vivir. Es un modo de vivir. O sea, lo que hablamos Spanglish, lo que escribimos en Spanglish, y vuelvo y reitero, repito, no porque ninguno de nosotros lo que estemos, estemos participando hoy tenemos algún tipo de, como consideren ellos, un tipo de handicap que no podemos lograr hablar en un idioma o en el otro concretamente. It's just because it's a way of life. Es, el lenguaje es un modo de vivir. Y yes, I, I heard what Fjord, what Fjord was talking about too. I, I heard it as well many times when I was a teenager. This whole thing of, of you're a cultural traitor because you're speaking the language of the oppressor as if Spanish came to the Dominican Republic with a visa or something like that. You know, it, you know they invaded as well. It, it go, you know, Dominican writers talked about it earlier in the chat. It, it is the language also of, of a colonizer, of oppressor. But it's because of that. It's because they don't understand that que el lenguaje es un modo de vivir. Um, and this is why they want to be gatekeepers and police the way people express themselves. Thank you. Yeah, so it, it does take people out of their comfort zone, right? Um, I like that. I think, Amanda, you said that, like, que pone la gente incómoda, ¿verdad? And then you have, like, You have like these traditionalists, right? Like la gente de la, 
de like, you know, la, la clase alta, y like, ay, esta gente, ¿qué es lo que están hablando? So, um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, works that you've been influenced by. And um, sorry, Edwin, like, cause you kind of like, you told us a lot of people, I guess, in, in there, you, you, you paid homage to, to people. Um, to some amazing um, artists. So let's let's just talk a little bit of, of that. Like, uh, you know, like even like before, I don't know, like when you when you started writing, even like you're like, okay, I've seen this, or like these are people that are like, even if they haven't exactly done what you're doing, but just people that uh where your your um source of influence came from. Um Roxana, you wanna start talking about that? De tus influencias. Um, influencia tengo poca. Yo, cada, o sea, cuando me toca la oportunidad de hablar en grupo, siempre digo que eh, yo empecé a, a, o sea, cuando crecí en una literatura más clásica, porque crecí en Santo Domingo, ya hice el bachillerato y todo eso, entonces tú sabes que en el colegio te dan otro tipo de libros a leer que no son usualmente... Eh, los libros que tú ves acá de, de dominicanos o de Spanglish o de la cultura de dominicana acá o fuera del, del país. Pero sí he visto eh, escritores como un ejemplo Fior, que está acá, que su libro, para hacer la nostalgia, me encanta. Y fue uno como de mi primer eh, encuentro leyendo de otra persona eh, con el uso del Spanglish y también Amanda eh, con, con Chula. Eh, ya si te digo otra persona te estoy hablando mentira y sería ya como que para que ustedes queden contentos con, con mi información pero no eh, influencia tengo poca pero sí admiro el trabajo que hacen Amanda y, y Fior me gusta mucho si escribo en Spanglish si un día me decido voy a publicar en un, libro, un libro en Spanglish me, la buscaría a ella para que me dieran su opinión realmente porque admiro mucho y respeto lo que hacen Gracias, Roxana. Thank you for being, you know, vulnerable and, you know, just uh, I'm having a great time just listening to everybody here. Um, what about you, Fjord? Talk about some of your influences. Espérate, Mariel. Es Roxana. Piache. Te paso tú, te paso. Bueno, yo llegué aquí cuando yo tenía 12 años. Pues ya es un poquito más diferente a lo de Rosana, porque eh, mi educación básica ya, yo estaba, como mencioné antes, yo estaba en una clase bilingüe, eh, entonces estaba aprendiendo el lenguaje, entonces yo creo que mi, una de mis primeras experiencias fue, eh, y Edwin lo mencionó, Borderline. Like, yo leí ese libro cuando tenía 12 años, y ahí fue cuando yo dije, oye, pero yo no estoy haciendo eso, yo no estoy hablando Spanglish en, en mi diario vivir. Y ahí como fue como que me dio ese pujoncito que yo tengo que escribir en sangre, son mucha eh, literatura de, de los chicanos, me, me interesó mucho en esa edad. En ese tiempo yo no leía nada dominicano, en la escuela no, no, no leía nada, yo no, nadie hablaba de, de literatura eh, dominicana. Eh, ya llegando a la universidad, más uh, me encontré con la literatura de los escritos de mi querida Josefina Báez. Esa mujer me abrió los caminos, me abrió el cerebro, me abrió todo. Eh, y también Sandra Cisneros, muchos Sandra Cisneros, Julia, uh, Julia Álvarez también, muchos. Y ya para lo, los demás, me dirigiendo mucho a la Spoken Word, Elizabeth Acevedo también. Pero muchas mujeres, me interesa la literatura feminista más que, más que nada. No voy a mencionar otra persona que me influyó porque me rompió el alma, me rompió el corazón con sus acciones, pero eh, mucha literatura en Spanglish. Gracias, Fior. Um, ¿quién, eh, oh, Edwin. Sí, eh, igual que Fior, eh, Gloria, definitivamente Gloria. That was like my first... That was actually the first time that I, I read Spanglish as opposed to just hearing it. I read it in, in a book and it was really, really transformative. Um, because this was before the whole, you know, 
fever and all that other stuff that came about afterwards that, that a lot of the Dominican Americans that was enganchado and, and kind of rolled that way. It was way before that. Um, also, there's from the Puerto Ricans from the 1930s, Jesús Colón, he was very good. Todo lo que tiene que ver con esa literatura de Chicano, you know, because they were doing this before in the East Coast, we started to do it, como quien dice, is definitely was of, of great influence for me. Um, in 2007, uh, Anessi Vice, I don't know if she's still, she's still at Lehman, but she definitely um, woke that up again in me. And this was, boy, this was right before, um, you know, came out with his book. So this is like a year before that. And the reason I love the way that she did it is because that's kind of the way that I feel comfortable doing the Spanglish where, um, to Roxana's point, where you, if you write Spanglish, you don't really have to write every two words or three words in English and Spanish as, as if you're putting it in a balance. You can write the whole damn sentence in English and just put one word in Spanish there and that's it, it's Spanglish. And it sounds beautiful and it sounds poetic. And Anessi Baez did that very well. I, I love that too. And, you know, and claro, da Josefina Baez and afterwards and all that other stuff as well. Um, but that was pretty much it for me. Eh, pero hay una nueva generación que le está dando seguimiento también ahora con Amanda, con su libro chula que está bacanísimo, y un sinnúmero de otras personas también. Y la de Fior, que lo tengo por ahí también. Muy bacano ese libro. Thank you, um, Edwin. Okay, Amanda, you want to you wanna talk a little bit about your influences? Yeah, yeah. So, um, definitely, igual, Josefina Baez, también, eh, Rita Indiana, both the music and the literature and, like, the image and, and just everything. <laughs> um, also, I, I was thinking about it now. I was like, you know, because when it comes to, to writing in general, there's a lot more. But when it comes to like Spanglish, I think Gloria Anzaldúa too, um, wasn't it a big influence? Um, maybe not like in style, right? Because that's more like Chicano, but definitely in, in just, you're allowed to write in Spanglish, you know? And I'm really influenced by music. I'm really influenced by music, um, by hip hop, by artists like No Name, I'm influenced by Spanish hip hop y reggaeton. Um, and yeah, and you know, again, because of this week, I've just been reflecting on this a lot. But I've said this before, the first time that I ever saw Spanglish and I was like, whoa, you can do that was when I was in school at Rutgers in New Jersey. Um, there was this fraternity that had an event where they invited the New Yorkian Poets Cafe um, they invited like their team that year of slam poets to go perform. And I remember Flaco Navaja performed and it was in Spanglish. And that, that really opened up my mind. I was like, you, you can do that, you know? And I think I was taking a creative writing class at the moment that did not have that at all, <laughs> like at all, <laughs> you know? And actually, Towards the end though, of that creative writing class, we did read Juno Diaz, um, cause Juno Diaz did graduate from Rutgers and it was like, um, you know, that was also a, a moment of like, oh snap, like you can write like this, you know? And I mean, I do think it's important to say it even though, um, you know, like Fior said, I don't know if that's who you were talking about, someone who like broke our hearts. I also do think that it's, It just shows like what, what the culture is, you know? The fact that this person who wrote this work also did all of this, you know? Um, I don't know if that makes sense. Like it's almost like you write misogyny and, and it turns out that you write, you might've been writing from experience, you know? Um, but yeah, I, I was really influenced by these people and and thank you so much to all of you for, for shouting me out, shouting my book out. I really appreciate it. And I feel like I need it. I'm a little stuck right now. I feel like I, I am, I'm having a little moment of like, I'm struggling to write. Um, so I appreciate the, the, just being on this panel today to talk about this. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, so I wanna save a couple of minutes at the end so that everybody can do a, uh, like a sound off and just talk about your projects a little bit. But we have uh, one question so far from Luana. 
So if anybody else has a question, please um, let me know in the chat. But um, Luana, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Thank you so much. It's more it's more of a comment because como buena dominicana de pura cepa, como decimos, I see that there are a lot of things in play. And as a professor of, of bilingual education uh, and a person, I did my PhD in linguistics. Right now, we are speaking about a phenomenon called translanguaging, which is using your entire repertoire to communicate an idea. And that idea could also be a creative idea. And I, you know, in, in my courses, when, when, when teachers are coming in and getting certified and asking, how do I support my bilingual students? We have to allow these spaces because you know, code switching, Spanglish, translanguaging is nothing new. When I was an undergraduate at SUNY Newport, I read a story, a short story by Ana, Ana Lidia Vega called Pollito Chicken which was written in 1981. And that was my first Spanglish short story that I, that I read. So it's nothing new, uh, quite frankly. And we also have to be a little bit um, forgiving of our Dominican brethren. Porque el dominicano, nosotros los dominicanos desafortunadamente sufrimos de una discriminación triple. Okay, we, we are discriminated because no hablamos buen español. Pero entonces si lo hablamos bien, ay, pero mírala a ella, qué fina. So I, I think that I, I'm so sorry. It's not a question, but when I hear you young people, todavía, it's been 30 years since I, since I graduated from, from college. And I'm still like, here we are again having this conversation. And what I try and do in my classroom with my students is encourage this translanguaging que no es algo accidental, lo hacemos entre nosotros, lo hacemos para indicar una hermandad lingüística de que somos dominicanos, and you get me and I get you, y machete y ley, nos metemos ahí full de todo. Amanda, isn't it interesting that the very same people that criticize us Dominican Yorks send their kids to American schools in the Dominican Republic? Te lo digo porque viví cinco años en Santo Domingo de mi vida adulta y fui profesora en las escuelas prestigiosas y son todas americanas. So, um, but there's also, like I said, I'm a little sensitive to that because of this constant discrimination that, that we go through as Dominicans. Porque no suenas como dominicana. A mí me han dicho, ay, pero tú no suenas dominicana. A mí me dijeron una vez lavadita, dominicana lavadita. Imagine how insulting that is. So we're constantly on this like double-edged sword where, you know, what, what, is our, what, is, what is our linguistic identity? And who are we pleasing with these identities, right? So that's sort of like a rhetorical question. Like who, what is our, what, what como dominicanos, cuál es nuestra identidad lingüística? Y a quién estamos complaciendo dentro de esa identidad lingüística? For me, yo soy dominicana, 100%, and I speak como me da la gana, and that's it. If you don't like it, ahí está la puerta, lárgate. Like, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Luana. Wow, that was like a, a great way to end. And like uh, Amanda said, linguistic identity, I'm taking that. Okay, so let's um, thank you all for being here with us tonight. Thank you to all the panelists. Muchísimas gracias. Um, so let's just finish it off by everybody just um, say, where can, where can people follow you? So maybe drop your, um, and you can also drop it in the chat, like your, your social media handles. And just talk briefly about any of the projects that you're, that you're currently working on. Okay, so please just like 30 seconds each because uh, uh, we're almost going to the very end. All right, I can go. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much for having us, Marilyn. Thank you so much to the, the conference folks. Thank you to Dominican writers. Um, thank you to all of you for your questions. I put my at on the chat. Um, so definitely follow me there. And yeah, right now I'm just working on a novel. Let's see how long it takes. You know, let's, I'm, I'm, I'm writing it. I'm writing, I'm writing it and writing it. Si queremos jugar con el lenguaje, ahí está. Bueno, gracias a todos por eh, ser parte de, del panel. Gracias, Marilyn, um, por, por coordinar todo esto a Dominican Writers. Una oportunidad muy, muy interesante para discutir esto del Spanglish. 
a los compañeros del panel, Fiora, Amanda, Edwin, muchas gracias. Y me pueden encontrar en arroba la casa de las maletas, underscore en Instagram. Y buenas noches. Sí, miles de gracias. Gracias por la invitación. Dominican Writers, Hostos Community College, DSA. It was wonderful. I loved it. I enjoyed it. I already dropped my ad link there. Edwin Rosario Mazara. All over, all over. Y Spanglish Bosses, you can follow that as well. Thank you. Uh, Fior? Yeah, uh, muchas gracias a todos. Un abrazo grande. Might just remind yourself to keep writing whatever you do. Keep doing that. Uh, me puede encontrar Mujer con Voz, underscore poetry, o mujercombos.com. Y mi plan es seguir existiendo y escribiendo lo que sea, lo que le, le, lo que le llegue a uno, ¿verdad? Gracias por todo. Gracias. Gracias a uh, Hostos Community College, Dominican, um, eh, Dominican writers, um, and thank you to all the panels, everybody that's here, and Dominican American Roundtable. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, have a great night. And keep writing. Vamos a seguir. Palante. <laughs> <laughs>